very much for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so in this talk, I would like to uh, present uh, some of my findings that can be used for to create an early warning system for heat waves over Europe. Oh, <clears throat> I'm quite in the fortunate position, let's say, to that it's very easy for me to find very recent examples of the impact of heat waves, particularly if you are looking at this summer. With uh, in July, where the UK reached a symbolic threshold of 40 degrees, while other re regions also uh, shattered, uh, shattered temperature re records. And during the same period, we had a very persistent drought, which was further exacerb exacerbated by the heat wave. And the combination of these two factors uh, can lead to widespread uh, wildfires. And on the right here, I'm, oops, I'm showing the uh, carbon emissions due to wildfires across the summer uh, in France. And you can see here the uh, summer of 2003 that really stands out, but also unfortunately that this year, we surpass already uh, these values. So now the question is how do we predict and how do we warn for such kind of catastrophic events so that mitigation actions can be uh, uh, taken. Now, in the <clears throat> example of, that, uh, of this, uh, this year's uh, heat wave, we had, for example, in the UK, the Met Office issuing a warning which reached the high highest levels for the red level. And one of the re reactions to that was, for example, by water companies that could tell us to reduce our water consumption so that the system isn't overburdened. But as you see here, really the mitigation instructions and uh, uh, actions really requires information from <clears throat> predictions. And for them to be effective, they really need to be timely. So they are actually really required an early warning. And this is underlined by the ready, set, go approach, which was also introduced by Frédéric Vita earlier which underlines that we, there are many decisions that are taken before the, um, uh, an event at different timescales, which do require predictions and forecasts at different timescales. If you are looking at extremes, you will generally start by looking at the climate. So looking at historical records to determine what kind of extremes you can have, what has an extent and what has a frequency. And in the context of climate change, you will be also looking at what is the uh, at projections to see what kind of evolution uh, these uh, events can under undertake. Um, then you will often look at the seasonal forecast where you are looking at more slow varying processes, which are mostly driven by the sea surface temperature and also looking at land atmosphere feedback. In this case, the information that we will generally get is whether the season or the months is uh, probably going to be either drier or warmer or, uh, or colder than usual. As you get uh, closer in time, um, you will, looking at the medium to short range, you will be looking at obviously shorter varying processes, which include large atmospheric features uh, like uh, bioclonic wave, Rosby wave packets, and blockings. But also are also much smaller scale processes such as adiabatic and diabetic processes. And the information that you will get is much more accurate on the timing, the extent and intensity of, very, of one specific uh, event. Now, as you see, I left out a blank and it's to highlight the time range which interests us in this talk, which is a subseasonal range. And as you see, it's in between the seasonal and the medium range. And it means also that it's borrowing from the seasonal and medium range, looking, for example, at land atmosphere feedback, at slow varying processes, more on the scale in this type um, of maiden Julian oscillation, for example, but also using weather regimes. And um, for this kind of forecast, what you can expect as information is more on the daily to weekly anomalies. So in this talk, what I would like to show is how to include subseasonal information into an early warning system. And we start that by looking first as the drivers or predictors for heat waves 
then looking at what kind of information they can provide us, and lastly, how can we include them into an early warning system. So we'll be looking at the drivers first, at three drivers, starting with the circulation patterns. And here's the idea is that circulation patterns are better predicted at the extended range compared to the surface parameters alone. So what you want to do is to identify circulation types that are responsible for heat wave. And we did that by first uh, identifying the heat wave and then clustering the heat wave based on the atmospheric circulation. And the result are these five uh, heat wave types, which are a uh, characteristic um, characterized by very specific circulation pattern. And by construction, they are very much correlated with heat waves. Now, the, le the next driver is soil moisture preconditioning. Now, the process we are looking at is over evapotranspiration, which leads to latent cooling. But if you reduce soil water content, you also reduce this cooling effect and further exacerbate heat uh, extremes. For this, we're going to, do, to uh, use the soil wetness index, which is a measure of the available water for evapotranspiration. So it varies between zero at the driest point to one when the soil is essentially saturated with water. And it does correspond to evapotranspiration rates varying between zero and 100%. So in this example, I'm looking at the soil wetness index integrated over two different regions, so over Scandinavia and over Southern Europe. And we are looking here at the uh, distribution at the onset of heat wave, so for the dotted curve and outside heat wave for the colored curve. And as you can see, for example, for Scandinavia, there is basically uh, almost no shift of the distribution at the onset of the heat wave. However, if you are looking at the Southern European uh, distribution, you will see there is a slight shift towards drier conditions meaning that um, regions in Southern Europe are more sensitive, or heat wave in this region are more sensitive to dry conditions. And as you can see, the shift is relatively small, meaning that it doesn't have a systematic effect on all events. However, it's very, it's very much key for some very extreme events. For example, the 2010 heat wave um, in Russia, where part of the reason for the extreme temperatures were the very dry conditions beforehand. The last driver we are going to look at is topical convection. And I depicted on the right the process that we uh, want to look at. So um, essentially, when you have enhanced precipitation, you, you, have, uh, you can create sources for Rosby waves. And this can propagate into the extra topics leading to, uh, to blockings and also being able to maintain them. Uh, so to follow the viability in, uh, in precipitation, we are going to look at the boreal summer intra-seasonal oscillation, which was already uh, introduced by, by Schroeder and Frederick Vita. So what we're going to do is we use the first two EOFs of precipitation to monitor the evolution of the BSI so. And we represent this by this um, as a figure on the right, which is a two-dimensional diagram, which some of you will be a bit familiar with, as it is, as it is quite similar to the wheeler handam diagram. And here we are looking at the evolution 14 days before the onset of heat waves uh, over Russia. And the colored lines represent cases where the BSISO was at a very high index value. So we have an active phase of the BSI. So, and it does correspond to around a third of Russian heat wave. Now it's uh, less uh, flagrant for other regions, but there are still some cases which are connected with the BSI. So now that we have our drivers, what kind of information can they give us? So we start with the circulation pattern and we know that they're associated with an increased likelihood for two meter temperature to exceed the 90th percentile, especially if we compare to the climatology. In this case, for the Scandinavian circulation pattern, you will see that it reaches three to four times the climatological probability. And what you want to do is essentially to use this to create a pattern-based forecast system. So the idea is just we forecast the circulation pattern and then combine this with the associated conditional probability 
to create a forecast and infer the probability of extreme warm temperatures. And we assessed um, this forecast by uh, using the Boyle skill score uh, integrated in this example over the Scandinavian region, which I just showed. And we are comparing here the Dyke model output, which is represented by the uh, line with the uh, circled markers with our conditional or pattern-based forecasting system with uh, uh, the stars. And as you can see, our forecasting uh, method has a quite a low score at the, sh uh, the short to medium range. However, if you are looking past 10 days, it uh, has a higher score compared to the direct, um, direct method. And more importantly, when you see here the markers, they represent that the forecast, um, the skill is significantly above the climatological reference. So essentially, we are enhancing or improving the forecast range, which is essential for uh, early warnings. Now, looking at the soil moisture, as I said, it doesn't have a systematically important in, um, impact. However, it's key to capture, uh, to capture the intensity of the heat wave. And in very extreme cases, it's actually one, of, uh, one very important factor. At the bottom, I'm showing the soil wetness index anomaly before the 2003 heat wave. And you see very dry conditions already uh, before, and it's actually one of the factors for the temperature extremes that we reach during the summer. <clears throat> Lastly, we are going to look at the BSI source, so at tropical convection, and we are comparing on the left active cases. So it means that uh, the BSI source is active at the forecast initialization compared to inactive cases on the right. And on the top, we are looking at the standard deviation, so the uh, spread of the forecast for five events, at uh, four days for each uh, event, and at uh, lead time of seven days in green, uh, 14 days in orange, and 21 days in black. And we aggregated all these results into this box plot. And essentially what we can see is that the spread at uh, lead times 14 and, and 21 days is lower for the active cases compared to the inactive cases. And we have quite a similar picture when we are looking at the root mean square error. So essentially the accuracy of your forecast where your error is slightly lower for the active cases compared to the inactive cases. But the difference is less significant. But the result is that we get a more confident forecast. And as introduced by uh, Frederick, it's, uh, it shows you a window of opportunity essentially. Now let's construct our early warning system. So we have our three components with the circulation patterns that give us indication of the probability of the heat wave. Then we can monitor the BSI so to get an information on the confidence of your forecast. And lastly, the soil wetness index to get an idea of the intensity of the potential heat wave. Now I'll be showing two examples for Russian heat waves 14 days in advance. And in this first example on the left, you will see the forecast probability for circulation patterns um, uh, represented at different lead times. As you can see, it's very similar to a weather regime product from uh, my supervisor, Laura Ferranti, wouldn't change, wouldn't change something that works. And as you can see from day 10, you, there is uh, increased probability uh, for Russian circulation patterns to occur. But also when you reach day 19, you also get the tripole circulation pattern that has a high probability, probability to occur. And this also affects very, uh, very much the Russian region. So if you combine the tripole and uh, Russian circulation pattern, you get a, around a 70% chance that um, a heat wave might occur over this region. Now, if you look in the middle, we are looking at the BSI so but 15 days before the, the forecast, so it's this evolution. And we see we have a very active BSI, so, so we can be quite confident that our forecast uh, will materialize. Lastly, we uh, do something similar with the soil wetness index, so look 15 days before, and we see that uh, conditions are actually quite wet. We have quite a high values for the soil wetness index. So potentially this heat wave isn't going to be particularly intense. 
And we are looking here at a heat wave in August 2007 that wasn't particularly extreme in the grand scheme of things. In this next example, we are looking again, forecast probability of the circulation patterns first, and we see there's quite a lot of activity very early on with, we are starting with uh, Scandinavian circulation patterns and the Southern Europeans and the Russian. So almost we get an idea that there is a propagation from west to east of a potential heat wave. And then we again see this triple circulation pattern that has quite a high probability to occur. So in this case, we might be looking at a heat wave that potentially be uh, more persistent. In the middle, again, we look at the BSI. So here's a, a picture is a bit uh, more mixed in a sense that only the last few days we have an active BSI. So and it's not as strong as before. So we might be maybe less confident into, into our forecast. However, on the right, we see the soil wetness index is actually quite low. So it reaches uh, below 0 0.4. So we have very dry conditions already before um, a heat wave could, uh, could happen. So if we have a heat wave, it could be more persistent and also more intense. And in fact, we are looking at the forecast for the 2010 heat wave uh, over Russia. So here, a brief summary. So we identified three drivers for heat wave and each of these uh, drivers provide different kinds of information. First one being the forecast probability of the heat wave, then the actual confidence in your forecast and also an indication of how intense this heat wave could be. And all this information is essential if you want to create an early warning system. Now I just want to finish with a last point and it's more of an open question is how do we actually assess the usefulness of such a product? Here I only looked at, um, I only showed the bias skill score, which is a more conventional and meteorological way of assessing whether your forecast is actually accurate. But we are using here probabilistic forecast and users often need to take a decision, which is in the uh, around a yes or no, whether it's I need to water my crops more or whether I need to, I expect a higher demand in energy because of uh, AC consumption and therefore do I need to prepare to increase my production in energy. And as you can see, it's very different questions from different sectors, which probably need very different metrics to really assess how useful this product is. So I'm pretty sure that uh, um, forecast product and uh, early warning system do require metrics that are specific uh, to the user. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Emmanuel. So we have time for uh, a few questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Very interesting presentation. I have two questions, in fact. Yeah. One is very quick, probably. So I'll start from that. Um, what layer of soil moisture do you use for your uh, soil water index? And are you using uh, what data set, ERA5 land? Uh, so I'm using ERA5 uh, at the moment, and it's the first three layers of soil, so it reaches uh, one meter. It's an integration of the first three layers. Yeah, it's the first three layers, exactly, yeah. Do I have time for a second one? Yeah. So <clears throat> it's very interesting. Um, like, yeah, what, what you did about the tropical convection mm -hmm. linked to uh, the forecast confidence. Mm. It is not really clear to me how you did it. So if you have a quick answer, mm. yeah. yeah, give it <laughs> otherwise we can talk later. Yeah. Because I, I didn't really understand it. Okay, so the idea is that we just used EOF to uh, essentially follow the BSI. So we use EOF of uh, detrended uh, precipitation data. And essentially you will get an indication of in which region you will have increased precipitation. So let me just try to go a bit. Um, yes. Yeah, in, this, uh, in here you can see the different, uh, dif uh, at the bottom, uh, up top and the um, left on the right, it's uh, showing the regions where you will have increased precipitation. So you will have uh, tropical convection and potential sources of Wesley waves 
And when we look at essentially just looking at the evolution just before the heat wave itself, to look just what uh, how many heat waves actually connected with it, and just uh, to try to see whether there's any first mathematical or statistical connection. And I didn't show this, but we also look at if we actually see a Rossby wave traveling towards Europe. And then we can see that for all of these cases, we get a propagation of a heat of a Rossby wave. Okay, thank you for the very interesting presentation. So you present uh, your thought about the source of predictability from the tropics comes from the Indian Ocean, right? Yeah. So, and uh, what about the Atlantic Ocean? Because um, we know there are several extreme weather events over the Western Europe, which could be related to uh, like NAO. Okay. And uh, some people say um, NAO is triggered by the SST of the Atlantic, but some people argue that uh, because the NAO is kind of a free mode, mm. so NAO can be generated independent of the SST condition of the Atlantic. So, but anyway, I think either of the answer is right. But anyway, there's some yeah contribution coming from the uh, SST to NAO, and the NAO eventually uh, you know controls the uh, extreme weather event of the western part of European countries. So, in that sense, I'm wondering. Um, you know, whether or not the Atlantic condition or SSD condition yeah. also play a role as a, in a tropical source mm. to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much for the question. It's very interesting. So the, the EFs are computed over a tropical band. So we do include the entire, uh, all the longitude. We are not looking only on the Indian Ocean. For Russia, it's really much the Indian Ocean where you have a propagation, so a northward propagation of enhanced precipitation that will be this source. For Western European yeah, heat waves, for example, you will have a source more over the Caribbean uh, ocean. And the only example which is actually quite well documented is the 2003 heat wave, where there is a consensus that there was um, increases of earth temperature over the Caribbean that are connected with um, the, the heat wave of 2003. Fortunately, is it's not systematic, so it's not really for all heat waves. And for Western European heat wave, it's maybe like two or three. But it's it's true that I think if you would construct uh, any kind of product in such a way, you could look also for all the, all other heat wave and look. Then here you will see it's a lower right uh, quadrant. But in for Western Europe, I think it's a, a upper left, which does correspond, uh, I think, to um, the Caribbean Ocean. So yeah, I agree on your point. Uh, there's also just one comment, I think, to this question by Laura Ferranti in the chat. The BSISO has a global pattern and it exhibits convection also in the tropical Atlantic. Yep. So this also I just wanted to add. Um, we also have a question in the chat uh, by Dominic Bühler. Mm -hmm. A uh, very interesting talk. When you compare pattern-based and direct output-based forecast, why is the direct output-based skill becoming negative? Is, th is this due to the missing calibration? So uh, I think the main reason for that is that we are forecasting, uh, let me just uh, show here. Yeah, okay. so one, uh, one of the main reasons for that is we are using the reforecast data to, uh, to assess the accuracy. So we are only using 11 members. Also, we are forecasting the 90th percentile, so very extreme temperatures. Generally, generally, the model will have a lower scale in these kind of conditions. Um, I did, um, in one uh, article which is still uh, under review, I show the fair boy skill score, which essentially gives you an idea of the boy skill score with an infinite number of ensemble members. And in this case, the boy skill score doesn't go negative. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, I think, yeah. Thank you, Manuel, for, for your presentation.